Saudi Arabia seeks to line up more Arab support as it threatens Iran with more hostility. But in a deeply divided Arab world, how much real backing can Riyadh actually hope for? And how far will it go in this high-risk standoff with Iran? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program with me, Peter Dobby. Now, the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran had already been cold for decades. This week, it froze over. The war of words started when Saudi Arabia executed the top Shia cleric, Nima al-Nima, and then it went from bad to worse. Demonstrators in Tehran set the Saudi embassy on fire. Saudi demanded that all Iranian diplomats leave its borders and Tehran has banned Saudi imports. Now, some say this escalation is in fact being fueled by domestic issues. The Saudi government has to deal with falling oil prices and Tehran is facing stronger opposition at home. But whatever the root causes, the conflict is now going global. The Arab League met in an emergency session in Cairo on Sunday and the Iran-Saudi tensions were reportedly the only topic on the table. The officials accused Iran of interfering in Arab affairs and undermining regional security. The Iranian threat to Arab internal affairs is quite clear. Iran is using sectarianism as an excuse. Iran has trained terrorists to create chaos. Brothers and sisters, we need our meeting to show our support to our sovereignty, our security, and we need to prevent interference in our internal affairs. Well, that same sentiment had been echoed just the day before when the Gulf Cooperation Council met in Riyadh. The GCC expressed full solidarity with Saudi Arabia and condemned the attacks on Saudi's embassy in Tehran. The Gulf leaders also said that antagonistic rhetoric from the Iranian government had directly caused those attacks. The Saudi foreign minister warned that GCC members could take additional measures in response to Iranian moves in the region. We would welcome the opportunity to see Iran act like a normal country, to be a peaceful country, to not interfere in the affairs of the countries of the region and to not support terrorism. So, but that is entirely in the hands of Iran. Well, as the Saudi-Iran dispute escalates, sectarian divisions within the Arab League seem to be deepening too. Bahrain, Djibouti, Sudan, cutting off ties with Tehran soon after Saudi did that. Well, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait and Jordan all recalled some of their diplomats from Iran. And all of those countries have lined up to express support for Saudi Arabia in this row. Oman signed up to the GCC statement backing Saudi, but it's always maintained a balanced position when it comes to tensions between the two countries. Iran, meanwhile, has the backing of Iraq and Lebanon, which both have sizable Shia communities. And it would have had serious support as well had that country not been suspended from the Arab League in 2011. Algeria and Morocco have called for both countries to show restraint. It's an important message. Iran and Saudi Arabia are on opposite sides of so many regional conflicts, not least, of course, Syria and Yemen. There are concerns that this latest spat could derail attempts to solve those crises and that this clash of energy giants could affect oil prices around the world. Well, let's now bring in our guests joining us here on Inside Story. From Riyadh, Ahmed Al-Ibrahim, Saudi Affairs Specialist and Security Analyst in Detroit, Saeed Khan, lecturer in the Department of Near East and Asian Studies at the Wayne State University, and in Tehran, Mohamed Marandi, Professor at the University of Tehran. Welcome to the program to all of you. Saeed Ahmed Khan, why have relations historically always been so bad? Well, I think we have to take a look at a, at a longer approach here. We have two major regional powers. We have the Saudis, we have the Iranis, uh, both are uh, petro-states, especially over the last uh, several decades. Uh, there was a detente uh, between these two countries uh, when the United States 
uh, regarded both of them as being important strategic allies in the Persian Gulf. Uh, President Nixon, in fact, referred to them as the twin pillars of American foreign policy uh, in the region. Uh, that has all changed after 1979, of course. Uh, it seems as though the uh, willingness to characterize this as a sectarian conflict is imprecise. What we're really looking here are economic, political, and even uh, cultural efforts to maintain power and influence in the region. We find now, of course, that there is instability uh, on the domestic uh, landscape uh, of both of these countries. The hardliners and the moderates, so to speak, in Iran are restive and are looking to gain their political uh, feet in that country. And in Saudi Arabia, we have a massive uh, political succession uh, change here going into the second generation uh, away from the founder, Abdulaziz Al Saud. Uh, that's inevitably going to go ahead and cause uh, conflict, uh, particularly given the fact that they have both been asserting themselves to uh, various uh, satellites and other regional powers in order to have this proxy war which has been underway for 36 years. Interesting that you talk about this being imprecise and talking about satellites in the region. It may be imprecise, but how does what you're telling us feed into where we are today and where we think this might go in the future? Well, what we have, and I think the uh, GCC and the Arab League meetings are quite instructive. Uh, what we have in the case of Saudi Arabia is uh, something far short of a categorical response and reaction against Iran. We have, of course, the case of Bahrain, which uh, unsurprisingly uh, followed Saudi Arabia's suit by severing diplomatic relations uh, against Iran. But it's telling to see that Oman, as you mentioned before, had a very uh, tepid uh, reaction, just simply a condemnation. Kuwait and Qatar uh, only recalled their uh, ambassadors. And in the case of the United Arab Emirates, it was only a downgrade. So we don't have then this uh, kind of unanimity on the part of the GCC. It's unlikely that we're going to find that in the Arab League uh, reaction as well. And if there is going to be some kind of condemnatory action against Iran, it's going to be more undergirded by the economic and the political realities than really looking at this as a sectarian matter. The fact that Djibouti and Sudan are Sunni is really incidental to the economic realities that these two countries have and the dependency with Saudi Arabia. Ahmed Al-Ibrahim, that's a perfect take on the potential problems facing your country here because this is about regional and domestic politics shot through the prism of religion, surely? Um, well, Saudi Arabia, since the incident happened, um, uh, actually did not look at this as a sectarian or from any way or possibly way that it has to do with any of Shia or Sunni. The, the, uh, if I go back a little bit, Nimr and Nimr was uh, executed as a, a Saudi man, violated the Saudi law like Osama bin Laden. He, 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 he put instructed people to demolish uh, countries and, and to kill people. This is what Nimr and Nimr did. Osama bin Laden was taken by the Americans. Nimr and Nimr was taken by the Saudis. So if it wasn't for the Iranians going and putting the embassies in flames in uh, Tehran and Mashhad, Saudi Arabia wouldn't cut relations or uh, diplomatic relations with Iran. But obviously, I enough is enough with Iran. Iran we, Saudi Arabia has been with a proxy war with Iran in um, Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, and everywhere. So basically, Iran is following any possible thing to instigate the Arab world. Even though a lot of people need to understand that Iran has nothing to do with the Arab world. Interesting. It's a Persian, just to interrupt uh, you for territory. a second. Just to interrupt you for a second, please. Interesting sure. that you say enough is enough. You got an apology from Tehran. The Iranian leadership wrote a letter to the UN Security Council, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, saying we will do our best to make sure that the people that attack the embassy will be brought to book. Why is that not enough? It's not enough because the apology, first of all, it's the apology was sent to the Security Council, not to Saudi Arabian government. This is number one. Number two, in the history of Iran, since the uh, revolution and this regime has been taking over the Iranian uh, uh, government, uh, words doesn't mean anything. They they say something, and on the ground they do other things. I mean, we've have nothing. Nothing have we've done except Iran has been causing problems, whether whether uh, whether in the Arabian countries or in the even in the Arabian Gulf. Two weeks ago, they were firing missiles next to an American ship. Of course, the American uh, the American government never said that because they want the diplomacy of uh, of uh, President Obama with his administration to go ahead with the nuclear deal. So we do understand in Saudi Arabia even what's our allies position in that case but it's time 
we step up. This government means business. This government takes step much way faster than the governments before. What I mean, the, 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 the recent administration in Saudi Arabia. And I think it's time for Saudi Arabia to stand. Enough is enough. Uh, Iran has been playing so much in uh, infiltrating with the, with, the, with the GCC countries. They've been sending uh, terrorists. They've been sending weapons. They even killed my own and almost killed my own ambassador in Washington DC okay, and the authorities I want to bring has been these people and they found point, I, I, so I'm going to stop you again if I may Mohammed Morandi Nima al Nima was another Osama bin Laden and whilst the apology was taking the whole debate in the right direction it went to the wrong person well I think the very notion uh, that uh, the uh, Sheikh Mr. Nimer was uh, the equivalent of Osama bin Laden uh, shows the way in which Saudi Arabia conducts itself and justifies its actions. And unfortunately, we see that uh, when it invaded Yemen, it used, it, it used the same uh, narrative, and it tried to portray this as an Iranian problem, whereas the problem was the Yemeni people. Th thus, we see t oh, 10 months after the Saudi invasion of the country and shock and awe, and the constant bombing of city after city and the destruction of the country's infrastructure, we see that the Saudis have utterly failed to get anywhere near even the capital of the country. And that shows that despite the fact that Yemen is the poorest Arab country and one of the poorest countries in the world, and despite the fact that Saudi Arabia has uh, the most expensive military machine in the world, uh, the Saudis uh, have lost a war and are incapable of defeating the Yemeni people because the whole point of this, the whole reason behind this defeat is because the, the, the Saudis have been fighting against the population. They tried to make this an external issue, an issue of Iran, but at the end of the day its defeat was because it was misleading itself and the rest of the international community. The same is true with the Sheikh. He was a, a, an, a person who basically uh, criticized Wahhabism and the discrimination that Wahhabism brings about for his community and for all people in his country who do not believe in Wahhabism. It's in the textbooks in the country, and this is something that okay. people across the region are concerned but, about. But Even as far in Egypt, as, the, as, far as the leadership where you are in Tehran are concerned, this is a perfect storm because post-2011, there is a new self-confidence. The world kind of looked in on your new leader, Mr. Rouhani, and it said, oh, it's not Ahmadinejad. We can work with Mr. Rouhani. So you're feeling emboldened. There's talk of sanctions being lessened. You're coming back in from the cold. So you're using that as leverage to push your agenda across the region as well? Well, President Rouhani and President Ahmadinejad were both people who tried to uh, work with Saudi Arabia. During the administration of President Ahmadinejad, the foreign minister, the Iranian foreign minister, went to Saudi Arabia and the Saudi foreign minister never returned the trip. Uh, during the current administration, Dr. Zarif has said uh, on numerous occasions, and so has the president, that they want better relations, but the Saudis have uh, escalated ever since. Not only have the Saudis been supporting extremists in Syria, something that the Iranians were saying uh, for f almost five years now, and now even y y Saudi allies are admitting this. The vice chancellor of Germany warned Saudi Arabia to stop spreading Wahhabi extremism in Europe. They, uh, the German intelligence said that Saudi Arabia is becoming a destabilizing threat to the Arab world. So this, has nothing, this is not Iran. This is the Western countries uh, that have traditionally been silent to much of what Saudi Arabia has been doing. Ahmed Al Ibrahim, I think you want to come US in at that General point. I mean, Flynn. I, 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 don't, I, I don't understand how is your guest is actually mentioning Yemen in his words and Syria and without saying that he had the besiege and all the Iranian uh, uh, army and, 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 and the revolutionary guard on the ground. I mean, he's talking about the Yemeni people. What business does the Iranian government nor the Iranian regime has with the Yemeni people? Saudi Arabia deals with governments. They don't deal with people. They don't instigate people over their leaders. If this you is deal with governments, you just admit the Iranian people. This is our the Iranian government. This is what they do. They fume the people on their leaders. If you and this deal is not with acceptable in Saudi Arabia. If you deal with governments, why has your government just upped its defense spending? 
by 5.3 in a moment sir by 5.3 billion dollars and operation decisive storm according to our friend in Tehran is anything but decisive and the logic seems to be we can bomb the Houthis into submission and we can bomb the Houthis to the negotiating table the reason that Saudi Arabia wanted it, it's, it's what's doing what's doing by restoring the legitimate government in Yemen that Saudi Arabia has a border with Yemen any country, any country, they want their stability, they need to secure their neighboring country. What Saudi Arabia is doing, they are trying to help the Yemeni people and the Yemeni government, the legitimate Yemeni government, to restore and have one Yemen without any infiltration from the Iranian government to the Houthis. And this is what Saudi Arabia has doing. Saudi Arabia can finish decisive storm tomorrow. But Saudi Arabia, they are concerned about the Yemeni people when they are trying to hit targets. They don't like to see one soul of civilian get injured. And that's why it's taking so long. We are winning on the ground. The government is winning. The liberation of Sana'a is very soon. I really don't understand where you, your guess where he's getting his information. I would like your guest to answer me. Where is uh, Salman Qasimi right now? What he's doing? Did he get injured in Syria or what, where is he exactly? So please, when you say your facts, okay, say it right. I would rather you take the steps like the Saudi government is doing. Saudi Arabia government, they invest in their people. Unlike your government, they export all may the I national wealth or, out of side of Iran. Listen. You well, know, we, we are, we yes, are talking speak, about $3 Carry trillion dollars has been exported out of the Iran and not been spent on the Iranian people themselves. Four billion Ahmed, was I'm spent going to on the you Again, I'm afraid, because you are kind of capitalizing our debate. Uh, Mohammed Morandi, please, sir, finish your point. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary uh, discussion. Uh, the Saudis, of course, they don't deal with people. They bomb people. That's what they've been doing in Yemen for 10 months. Uh, they've also created a siege and are forcing starvation on much of the population and that's gone silent in the West. It's not supporting a legitimate government. Uh, the uh, Hadi was uh, well, the Ayatollah only candidate is the legitimate in guy. an election. He Ayatollah was supposed, to be, he was supposed to be elected for two him. years. If I'm not allowed to speak, then I'll go just be quiet. Gentlemen, I'm going to ask you all to be quiet. Uh, for the he next, was supposed just the next to be elected for two years as the provisional president. Then he uh, resigned. He left the capital. He left the country. He has no legitimacy. The only legitimacy that the Saudis uh, recognize is those people who, who work for them. And the Saudis don't even respect their own people. If they care for their own people, they would not be waging all these wars against neighboring countries. Gentlemen, we are going to pause for just a second because I just want to carry on breaking down what the story is and the significance of this for the broader region because the heightened tensions with Iran come at a time when Saudi Arabia's wallet is already feeling the pressure. So much pressure, in fact, that they're considering selling off at least part of the state oil company. It's Aramco. It has exclusive control over Saudi Arabia's oil since the 1970s. Officials say it's worth trillions of dollars, making it the world's biggest company, and that it pumps more than 10% of the world's oil every day. Now, on Friday, the Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman said they might start floating shares in the company to increase its transparency, whilst also raising funds for expansion and boosting the Saudi stock market. Uh, Saeed Ahmed Khan, how much of that do we have to blend into our thinking here? Because on the one hand, you've got a new Crown Prince. He's 29, 30 years old. He's very, very aggressive. He runs the defence ministry. You've got his half-brother who runs the royal court. You've got oil price going down, 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 and yet the Saudis have 100 billion socked away. And yet, the subtext to the other relationship in our debate today, the United States getting on with Iran, and the US is almost, it's at a tipping point now, it's almost energy independent. And I, I'll come to Saudi Arabia in a moment. The Saudis are looking in on this and thinking, we've lost our best friend, the United States, and we need to do some sort of a grab for something that we haven't quite defined yet. Well, I think that's a very important point, and it's instructive to see what Washington's reaction was to this latest conflict. It was very balanced, uh, saying that uh, the Obama White House uh, sought 
uh, a uh, kind of uh, balance and uh, restraint on all sides and all parties, which is rather amazing given the fact that it uh, considers Saudi Arabia officially to still be a major ally, and it still does not have diplomatic relations with the other country, Iran. So to have this uh, rather uh, balanced uh, view uh, and assertion that it makes is instructive of where Washington seems to be going in its geostrategic posture toward the Persian Gulf. Now, more specifically, looking at the proposed uh, share sale of Aramco, uh, Mohammed bin Salman reminds me an awful lot of uh, Ismail, uh, the governor of Egypt uh, in the 1870s uh, in that country when he then sold uh, the Suez Canal uh, to the British. Uh, we find that it is perhaps reflective of the kind of economic dire straits that Saudi Arabia finds itself. Uh, the global oil market is much more volatile in the sense for Saudi Arabia that Saudi Arabia doesn't have the kind of leverage and influence it once had. The United States in particular has become an oil exporting country. The uh, current uh, influenza, shall we say, in China with its economy is also going to affect the oil markets. When uh, Saudi Arabia did sever diplomatic relations with Iran, it was most certainly hoping that there would be, through speculation, a bump in the price of oil. Uh, that only went up uh, for a few hours, and then it restabilized back to $32 a barrel. So I think that although he's very ambitious, he's very aggressive, uh, the current deputy crown prince, who of course has his eyes on the throne, uh, is acting too impulsively and too impetuously for Washington and many of the Western allies of Saudi Arabia right now. Mohammed Mirandi in Tehran. Can your administration get the support that it wants, the same kind of uh, constituency of support that Riyadh wants across the region, despite the fact that there is a conflict within the regime in Tehran? There are people who want to derail what Rouhani is trying to do, and they're kind of giving him free reign, or they're making the right noises when it comes to what your bosses want to achieve. Well, I don't know why you say bosses and regime. Iran has different political parties. We have elections, and uh, the, there are checks and balances. We have a constitution. And uh, the current president, his position on Saudi actions in Yemen, in Syria, their support for extremism in Yemen, their support for a, a, a president who resigned and who was supposed to leave office after two years and who didn't, his, his position has been quite clear. And uh, the belief in Tehran is that Saudi Arabia, just like, as I said, the vice chancellor of Germany has been saying, is that the Saudi Arabia is, pr is promoting extremism. And uh, all of the uh, extremist groups that we see, whether it's Boko Haram, the Taliban, whether it's ISIL or the Nusra Front, or whether it's the terrorists in Paris and in the United States, all of them have a similar ideological background, and that is Wahhabism, which is being promoted by uh, the Saud family, which is not very religious itself, but it's promoting these, these extremist, uh, this extremist ideology for self-preservation. And in many cases, it's been funding extremist groups as well. This has been the position of Tehran. Uh, okay, in, uh, just Iran's let me put that last point region, to is, our guest in clear. Riyadh. So I'm going to interrupt you as well. Ahmed Al-Ibrahim, um, can I suggest to you what you are doing? Your country is setting itself on a course where, point number one, you have got to get pan-Arab support. Point number two, if you let the genie out the bottle and, and manipulate a sectarian divide, if you accept that's what you're doing, you may never get that genie back in the bottle and, in effect, you're redrawing the borders of the entire Middle East and you're propagating the Arab Spring because, arguably, the Arab Spring is not over yet. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I have a couple uh, just a quick question regarding uh, Aramco going uh, IPO. As you know, um, Aramco is not going to go 100% IPO. Probably the government's going to own 51 to 60%, and 40% is going to be floating in the market. Uh, I don't think Saudi Arabia is really desperate economically. Uh, we have uh, uh, so much reserve that we could always pull from. However, they are trying to diverse uh, everything other than oil. Uh, they are trying to uh, get uh, the youth people to think more entrepreneurial. As far as America, uh, the United States, the United States will always be our ally. I don't think the um, 
the relation is going to be affected uh, worse than what we're going with the Obama administration. I think everything is going to be reset by the new president that's going to come to the United States, and he might take uh, other steps different from the president before. I think we suffered, uh, suffered, Saudi Arabia suffered in the past eight years, and what we see in the region is the weakening of the current U.S. presidency. Um, as far as uh, Saudi Arabia export Wahhabism, Saudi Arabia does not export Wahhabism, and we are actually very moderate comparing to the uh, to the uh, to the Iranian uh, regime. Uh, actually, okay, we are I'm concerned have about to the forty militia like Hezbollah and Iraq again, and Ahmed Syria. Al Ibrahim, and, uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, I, we really do appreciate your time. Thanks to all our guests, Ahmed Ibrahim, Saeed Khan, and Mohammed. Uh, Morandi, and thank you to our viewers for watching. As always, you can leave your comments on the programs page on our website, aljazeera.com. You can post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Tweet us at AJ Inside Story or tweet me, I'm AJ Dobbs. From me, Peter Dobby, and everyone on the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you very soon.